evidence, uh, class of evidence, but um, um, anyway. Uh, so I would like to present a case of 50-year-old wild male patient that um, suffered um, recently TIA, and he was found to have a critical stenosis of right uh, internal, common, uh, internal cord artery uh, diagnosed by duplex Doppler. And um, it was diagnosed a high localization with um, high barfurcation. His past medical history were a myocardial infarction. Uh, he had uh, active ischemic heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes mellitus. And probably for these reasons and for um, an anatomic uh, characteristic of the lesion, he was qualified for carotid artery stenting. So dual antiplatelet therapy was initiated and statin therapy was initiated as well prior to uh, intervention. Um, intervention was done in uh, our hybrid room uh, with local anesthesia and uh, through femoral uh, puncture, a short six French introducer sheath was um, inserted, 5,000 units of uh, unfraction heparin was given intraarterially, and the right common carotid artery was uh, cannulated. And then the, the short um, introducer sheath was exchanged for a long uh, six French introducer sheath. At this stage, uh, the arteriography, the selective uh, arteriography was performed uh, that showed very tight uh, stenosis of the internal carotid artery, uh, more than one centimeter from um, the bifurcation. So, um, introduction, uh, um, a distal neuroprotection ambushed, uh was introduced. Uh, the patient was given one milligram of atropine, and predilatation was four millimeter balloon catheter uh, was done. Then uh, the stent, uh, aculing. Uh, seven to 10 uh, over 40 millimeters was implanted. Um, the atropine was given once again and post dilatation with six millimeters balloon catheter um, was performed. And the arteriography uh, uh, was performed that showed um, a satisfying, uh, we, we, we call it satisfying results, though there was some residual stenosis, but due to some calcified lesion and we we know from my experience that it's the, the danger to over the light. And uh, as we routinely, what we routinely do, uh, we do intracranial um, uh, arteriography, and what we found, the occlusion of the M2 branch of mid cerebral artery. And um, uh, then the patient uh, simultaneously was examined, and um, we found that he uh, has a left upper limb paresis. So, um, mm, though we didn't see any bleeding in our angiography, the, tra the patient was immediately transferred to a uh, CT scan and uh, intracranial hemorrhage was excluded and uh, additional 300 units of unfraction heparin was given. And um, uh, then the patient was transferred to radiology suite and a neurointerventionist was called. Um, and uh, he um, he managed because we we maintained the access. We didn't didn't remove uh, the the sheath. We exchanged again for short sheath, and uh, through the same access, um, he managed to cannulate the um, middle cerebral artery with microcatheter, and then was the combination of uh, local thrombolysis and aspiration. Um, he managed to recanalize the uh, branches of. Um, middle uh, cerebral artery. And uh, the patient almost immediately recovered from uh, left upper limb paresis. And the, the rest of this, uh, the post-operative uh, period was uh, uneventful uh, from the neurological point of view. Uh, he suffered uh, from the groin pseudoaneurysm that was um, successfully treated with uh, percutaneous thrombin injection. Um, so. Um, basing on this case, uh, I think I may say that um, uh, coronary artery stenting of critical stenosis, uh, internal carotid arteries carries a high risk of thromboembolic complication and a completion of cerebral angiography and the availability of immediate neuro intervention is essential for prompt recognition and successful treatment. So, um, carotid artery stenting should not be 
a routine procedure for a symptomatic cord artery critical stenosis. Thank you for your attention, and I would like to take the opportunity to invite everybody to a conference in November in Poznan that we were talking about uh, uh, the new uh, endovascular possibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting case presentation. We get frightened first, and then we start thinking of what has happened. OK, from your point of view, what was the uh, cause of embols? Maybe the plaque? And if it is a piece, a fragment of the plaque, how did you manage to uh, dissolve it? Question. Uh, frankly, and 100%, I, I don't know what was the cause, because um, we, we assume that it happened um, at the end of the procedure. Um, but um, it's also possible that there was some emboli from the plaque of some fresh thrombus um, from the plaque, that, uh, or some thrombus that was in, in the filter side. Um, it, um, well, we we were uh, most of all happy that we managed to save um, this patient, and of of course you are right that if it were a calcified plaque, um, the thrombolysis would not be of any help, um, and it could be because sometimes a, a plaque or a fragment of a plaque can protrude through stent cells and embolize the um, cerebral vasculature. Uh, or it could be a, a sort of combination of some calcified debris and fresh thrombus, and maybe it was the most, um, um, the most common, the most probable cause. Thank you. Question. Tell me, please, uh, if you encountered like a technical difficulties that required pre-dilation. Why didn't you uh, use proximal protection as opposed to distal protection? Uh, it's more difficult technique-wise, plus you know, uh, the rate of embolization is higher. Why it was proximal, not distal? That the proximal protection, at least um, uh, in theory, is, is safer. Um, well, we, we didn't use it this time. Maybe it was would be a good uh, solution. Um, we use it from time to time, but um, it's more time consuming and sometimes more technically demanding. Um, well, we, we didn't, we may, maybe we didn't have it uh, at, at our shelves or maybe just, um, you know, that the distal nerve protection was opened and uh, we, we tried to use this. Спасибо. Thank you.